Good morning, everybody. This is Eureka John, and you are at Eureka Street Crypto Hub, broadcasting live from Leander, Texas. It is 8.11 in the morning. I slept in today. I did. I really did, because I feel like a squashed bug this morning. Um, I think the week just caught up to me. Um, maybe I had too much candy last night as I was watching a movie with the kids, and uh, yeah, nowadays, I'm, being, I'm right on in deep into middle age manhood. Uh, sugar uh, gives me a hangover now. <laughs> anyway, um, it's uh, October 16th, 2021. And um, yeah, uh, this is episode 297. And I've been doing this for almost a year now. Um, October 24th, 2020 uh, it was when I started. I would do it every single morning. This is my video blog. That's all it is. Nothing more, nothing less. And uh, I'm documenting the good, bad, and ugly of my crypto journey and me just kind of stumbling my way through the crypto space and discovering, you know, projects, both good, bad, and ugly also, and um, talking about the concepts, um, everything related to crypto. I've had interviews on here. Um, you know, some things have been amazing. Other things have just been complete trash. So, yeah, this is it. This is what I do. And, um, I mean... Yeah, I do work a day job, so don't worry. I'm not quitting my day job anytime soon. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so here I am, Eureka Street Crypto Hub. All right, so let's look at the Bitcoin prices. Oh, I'm not here to uh, shill anything either or to uh, to be your teacher, and I'm not your financial advisor. Although I will be, and I'm not sponsored by anybody, but I will be kind of doing this sort of um, unofficial, official ambassadorship with abra wallet now so i if i'll put my referral link not in this video but in future videos so you can join the abra the reason i chose abra because i get a lot of offers like this um was because abra wallet was the first wallet i had and it is a really easy wallet for users to start with so if i'm gonna like be bringing people into crypto then at least i want them to get with like a decent wallet that's um you know, the fees aren't too bad. Uh, it's real easy to use. You get to keep your own keys to your own crypto. It's a great onboarding, so all that stuff. Anyway, I'll stop trying to shill them and talk about them. But uh, it's a, yeah, I, I'm going to be kind of in a, a sponsorship in a way by them. So uh, that's appreciated. So if you see me talking about that and, uh, you know, you, you want a wallet, well, that the link is there and that's why I'm talking about it. So, you know, all right. Um, so Bitcoin's at $61,034.40. Ethereum is $3,915.78. Uh, Binance going $469.94. Cardano, $221. Tether's a dollar. XRP's a dollar fifteen. Solana, $159.81. Polkadot, $42.54. USDC stablecoin along with Tether in the top 10. And then we have uh the Doge at 10th place. When's that we're gonna kick the dog out of the house, man? Seriously, we kicked Shiba Inu out way down to 18. Get out of here, dog. You know, so um and Terra rightfully is moving up. Same with Uniswap and Avalanche and um you know, Chainlink should be way up there, you know, like but uh it's not and uh yeah and i think polygon matic should be too because it's an amazing layer two solution uh, but anyway i'll stop uh diving in today i'm going to be talking a little bit more about some fundamentals you know sometimes i talk about some weird obscure projects like i kind of did yesterday i talked about some obscure gaming projects on solana other days i you know talk about like the macro picture you know what the market's gonna do you know web 3.0 and bitcoin and all that and uh then other days I just, you know, um, talk about, uh, I, I do interviews and then, um, some days I just reel it back and you know, some days I talk about concepts like technical concepts, like ZK rollups and zero knowledge proofs and stuff like that. What Byzantine fault tolerance is. And then, uh, today, and then other days I just talk um, uh, about like fundamentals and uh, today I'm going to reel it back and, you know, read an article by one of the founders of, um, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin as we know it. Some people believe this person to be Satoshi Nakamoto, and whether that is true, I have no idea. And uh, so let's go over here to this article. It's Nick Sabo. And for those of you that know who Nick Sabo is, uh, he's pretty much amazing and Billy really Badass. And I give credit to Vlad Kostea here for uh, um, showing me that or posting this um, Nick Sabo's blog yesterday. Uh, he's He's a Bitcoiner and a little bit of a maxi, but uh, that's okay. Yeah, I, I, I see. I don't think of of altcoins 
as shite coins or altcoins. Um, I think of them as Web 3.0 technology. So Bitcoin's Bitcoin. You know, you have apples, you know, and then you got bananas or a lot of people say oranges. So Bitcoin's the apple. Um, all these other Web 3.0 alter altcoins are the, the banana. Um, they're not good. They're not bad. They're I mean, they are good. I and mean, bananas are good for you. Uh, they're high in potassium, you know, but uh, <laughs> but they're just different. And so, um, you know, I think, um, you know, Bitcoin is amazing and I love Bitcoin just like I love apples, you know, but I like bananas, too. And uh, they have a whole other use and they're they're Web 3.0. Yes, there's a lot of crap out there and uh, a lot of candy that tries to pretend it's a banana. Yeah, you know? um, <laughs> but there's a lot of really good Web 3.0 projects um, that you can find. And, uh, you know, like all this stuff, you can't just discount all this stuff and say only Bitcoin's amazing. You know? <laughs> like, like there's Theta right here. I love Theta. Axie Infinity is taking over the gaming world and bringing in, ushering in a new gaming era. Cosmos is blockchain 3.0. You know, like uh, there's just so much potential out there. Chainlink is an Oracle funneling data into the blockchain. You know, Ethereum, I mean, DeFi is built on Ethereum. I mean, it's just like, so yeah, you can't just go discounting you know, web 3.0 because you love apples, you know, so I don't know, but, you know, regardless, I learn a lot from people like Vlad and from um, other Bitcoin maxis too, because I don't stop learning and yeah. So anyway, he shared this article and um, yeah, I slept in. So the kids are up now. So if you hear the kids, that's if they barge in, whatever, ain't my, ain't, it's my fault, whatever. But uh, okay. So anyway, um, Here's the article by Nick Sabo and people, some people say he's one of the founders of, uh, uh, that he's, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto himself or the team that would be called Satoshi Nakamoto, the anonymous inventor of Bitcoin and the author of the white paper. Um, uh, so Nick, I'll read a little blurb about him. Nick Sabo is an American cryptographer and computer scientist who has largely contributed to digital money and cryptocurrency as well as to digital contracts. Nick is a graduate of the University of Washington with a degree in computer science. Nick Sabo's concept of smart contracts, so he's one of the inventors of smart contracts, or the inventor, is now one of the major features of cryptocurrency and one of the most prominent fields of study. Some people suggest that Nick Sabo is the Bitcoin developer hidden with Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, pseudonym, and Nick is in fact a major indirect contributor to Bitcoin technology. Nick Sabo's BitGold concept of decentralized digital currency is a precursor of the Bitcoin architecture. However, Nick himself repeatedly denied his connection to Nakamoto. Today, the opinion of uh, Nick Sabo on Bitcoin issues is one of the most trusted and professional in the field. And yeah, I read quite a bit of stuff on Nick Sabo and uh, listened to audio stuff on Nick Sabo. Um, a lot of his li literature is here in the nakamotoinstitute.org. Um, so check out Nakamoto Institute. There's just so much literature here from a lot of the founding uh, people in, in uh, cryptography and in uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. Um, I mean, it has the white paper right here. So if you want to read the Bitcoin white paper for yourself, it's right there. And I did a reading. I've done a reading of the white paper on this show. I did a reading of Wei Dai's B Money um, a couple weeks ago. Um, I plan on going through and reading a lot of these. I did a reading of the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. Um, by Timothy C. May, and I've done a reading of the God Protocols by Nick Sabo, and uh, yeah, you know, the God Protocols is basically what Chainlink is is uh, you know, tries to to uh, uh, base itself on. And uh, let's see here, uh, there's another one, Shelling Out the Origins of Money. That's a really good article. I I listened to an audio reading of it by Guy Swan on Spotify. So. Um, it's kind of long, but it's 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 amazing. It's super fascinating to learn about you know, the origins of money uh, via the eyes and words of of Nick Sabo. Um, so yeah, so Nick Sabo is he's a, he's a heavy hitter. Some of the other candidates for being Sashi, Satoshi Nakamoto are Wei Dai, Adam Back, um, Hal Finney. Uh, I think David. No, David Chom's a little too early. Um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, let's get back to the subject at hand. So let's look at this article by this blog post. And this is from May 7th, 2009. Liar resistant government. Okay, so I'll start reading a little bit and I'll stop if I need to. All right. 
Uh, let me go back over here to my float live stream. I'm broadcasting on float.app. That's F-L-O-T-E dot app. And I broadcast on there every single morning. And um, it's a really solid streaming platform and decentralized social media platform. It's kind of like a mix between Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook and all that stuff. It's all the good parts of it. And it's decentralized, built on the IPFS network and not through centralized servers. So, yeah, and they're going to be coming out with... The new float version, uh, it'll have its float token. Right now, it's still even Bitcoin compatible. So yeah. Anyway, so um, uh, so liar resistant government. Um, I have extensive extensively explored the technological codification of certain pr aspects of law. That is that is smart, as in smart weapons. These could implement in digital protocol important parts of the law that are now processed by the mind via legal language or through physical enforcement. My focus has been on smart contracts, smart property, and other such technological reifications of private law. Here I explore the dangerous territory of extending these ideas to public law, especially to governmental forms and legal procedures. Officials of a wide variety of governments have too often over the course of history covered up or falsified evidence, destroyed or forged public records, and introduced other lies into legal and political processes. We need to protect future legal procedures and other governmental operations from such abuses. Ah, okay, yeah, laying out a pretty good problem there. Um, the canonical problem explored by computer scientists in designing these protocols, the Byzantine general problem, which I've talked about quite a bit on the show, is itself an exercise about liars in government. All right, so this article focuses on technologically ensuring the veracity and execution of those steps of legal procedure which are capable of such enhancement. In, uh, in parentheses, formalizable or objective aspects, which I call dry, in contrast to many inherently subjective and non-syntactical wet aspects of law. <laughs> Interesting. Subjective stuff in law is really wet and objective type of stuff, like cut and dry is cut and dry. <laughs> I guess that's, yeah. All right, so um, securing chains of evidence. So, all right, so this article focuses on technologically ensuring the veracity and execution of those steps of legal procedure which are capable of such enhancement. Um, and uh, colon, securing chains of evidence, securing chains of command, securely recording and publicizing the ownership and transfer of property and so on. All right, okay, so uh, a set of ideas I have for procedural law or government broadly defined is that many of its dry steps might be based on Byzantine fault tolerance protocols along with cryptographic protocols that form tamper evident structures such as unforgeable chains of evidence. I described some of these and related protocols further here, 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 and it gives links, but I will describe the basic idea of Byzantine fault tolerance here. And I was just about to describe Byzantine fault tolerance, but here he's gonna, re he's gonna um, summarize it here. So the basic idea of a Byzantine fault tolerant protocol is that it is a highly distributed peer-to-peer -peer protocol robust from certain friction or less of its participants lying about information originally observed or created by one or a small subset of them. All right, so think about a bunch of uh, generals surrounding a castle. And uh, you, know, you have everybody planning on at a specific time in the morning to raid the castle and you th this castle is huge so it's like maybe 15 generals around this castle well they all need to coordinate so they make sure they're all attacking at the same time instead of somebody charging first and then them just getting completely slaughtered and then uh the other people coming coming along at different times and everybody gets slaughtered so how do they do that um well they have to have messengers going around and uh, making sure that everybody does it on time and what if uh, one of them is lying or has the incorrect information or something like that? Um, and there has to be some kind of tolerance to allow for a certain amount of ambiguity um, in that information being passed around. And so uh, that is the Byzantine fault tolerance uh, problem. So how much of that ambiguity do you allow? Uh, so um so i'll read this part again the basic idea of a byzantine fault tolerant protocol is that it is a highly distributed peer-to-peer -peer protocol robust from a certain friction or less of its participants lying about information originally observed or created by one or a small subset of them all right so some of those messengers might not be telling the truth or might not have all the correct information so the friction varies based on various assumptions of the model but common figures are one third and one half for information originating from one node, assuming that that node is truthful. 
If the friction required for successful collusive lying is not achieved, and such an attack requires either informed negotiations occurring before this protocol step or negotiating the collusion in a single step, the latter possible to avoid by assuming fraud if messaging is normally delayed. Anyway, the liars are detected and can be excluded from future participation in the network. In a less formal sense, Byzantine fault tolerance protocols are simply distributed peer-to-peer -peer networks with dense communications. All right. Um, at least if efficient, but uh, most secure versions, every node sends every bit of information to every other node. Okay. Um, so in a less for formal sense, Byzantine fault tolerance protocols are simply peer-to-peer -peer distributed networks with dense communications in order to protect against the minority of colluding liars and to detect and exclude any liars who have not reached the threshold of collusion and thus can be excluded from the network. So it acknowledges that um, anytime you try to do something, there's always liars. There's always going to be those bad eggs and people that try to mess it up. The weak chains, you know, and the link in the chain, weak links in the chain. And it tries to figure out how much of that can we really withstand and tolerate before the system just completely breaks down. All right. And what's the best way to get rid of them? All right. So Byzantine fault tolerance protocols are not as strong as cryptographic protocols. They can also suffer from the sock puppet problem. Also called in some literature the Sybil problem, and there's Sybil resistance, in which one or a few liars control a much larger and sufficient fraction of network nodes. If the participants are not strongly identified as unique individuals, so that's the Sybil resistance. And a Sybil attack and 51% attacks are when bad actors um, or liars and and people trying to to manipulate the system to their benefit take over more than 51% of the network. So they have the power to control the direction of the network. So that's a Sybil attack. So thus where it is possible, we should augment the augment these dense peer to peer protocols with or use instead stronger cryptographic schemes such as hashing and a variety of cryptographic signatures. If the Byzantine pro protocol is overcome by collusive liars in a way that cannot be detective detected before sufficient collusion occurs, or prevented by cryptography, some outside manual meta protocol is required to figure out who is lying and repair the network or create a new network containing a truthful state. And uh, that would be, you know, a fork. <laughs> you know, if something gets so bad or so corrupted, um, they really need to create an outside protocol to figure out how to correct it or to just fork the whole thing altogether. Yeah. For, and create a whole new network. So for some kinds of communications, digital signatures and a chain of evidence based on cryptographic hash chains are much stronger, are a much stronger security against forgery. Byzantine protocols with their imperfect detec detection and exclusion of liars are to be relied on only where the lie is of a nature not amenable to prevention by crypto cryptographic chains of evidence. All right, so sensors and effectors can be readily hooked up to these highly high integrity networks. So cryptography can, for example, provide us an unforgeable chain of evidence from a security camera to our computer displays and an unforgeable return chain of command from our mice to a gun or a jail cell lock. Okay, so you use cryptography you know, to create the unforgeable connection from a security camera to a computer display. So nobody can go in and mess with it. You know, you see all the movies, you know, these hackers come in and, you know, they, I can just log into the system and, you know, change the camera to show, you know, just blank space while you run in there and do the diamond heist. And then, then it's on for five minutes. You have five minutes to do so, you know, and then it goes back, the camera goes back to normal. But with a cryptographic, um, you know, blockchain technology, there's no way that somebody would be able to do that. So, Crypto cryptography can also secure smart contracts with the local officials. A judge declares you bailable, said authorization being transmitted to your jail door. Your girlfriend fills out a web form which pays the bail bondsman with a credit card. The bondsman computer debits her account and then puts up the digital bond and the jail door opens. So uh, you're out and I don't get you to date your kind-hearted girlfriend. So yeah, if you're stuck in jail and uh, there's an unforgeable way to get you out of jail, not basically on the whims of you know, any type of uh, legal authority. So uh, one popular piece of secure government that many people have worked on is secure voting. All right. Uh, several years ago, I sketched an important sub-protocol of liar-resistant government, namely secure property titles, or more generally, secure public registries. 
All right. Uh, such titles could, of course, include titles to political as well as real, personal, and intellectual property and physically security and physical security devices such as sensors and weapons could be controlled based on them. In addition to the cryptographic integrity of the records themselves, the public title registry can follow any rules of transfer in at least a Byzantine failure resistant sort of way. Normal title transfers signed over by the former owner would be cryptographically strong. Besides the obvious real property titles, domain names, and so on, these registries um, could, se could securely record and transfer the shares of a corporation. Bitgold, my sketch of an electronic currency that minimally relies on trust in any one person or organization, achieves this minimal vulnerability by using secure property titles. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto has an implemented Bitcoin, which very similarly uses a dense Byzantine fault-tolerant peer-to-peer -peer network and cryptographic hash chains to ensure integrity of a currency. Making a number of important legal and political functions liar resistant is on the horizon and bits and pieces of, the, of, the, of this task are already being implemented. And this was 2009 and this was the beginning and this is the whole, I mean, it's kind of laying the bedrock and the foundation of um, you know, IOT, smart contract technology, um, things like uh, automated cars in which, you know, this whole idea of the World Economic Forum, you will own nothing and you will be happy. This is kind of what they're talking about. And as much as I can't stand the World Economic Forum and the way that they're wanting to implement all this um, through lockstep and all that stuff, they have something uh, going in, in which they're trying to implement this stuff here in which, you know, you don't need any intermediaries to get anything done through the mix of AI and blockchain technology and IoT devices and uh, large decentralized data and all that stuff floating around. Yeah, you could say, you know, I need a car to pull up in front of my house. A car will pull up. That car itself will be owned by a pool of token holders in that car with a multi-sig wallet on it. And part of that multi-sig wallet, um, a percentage of that going to maintenance. And when that car decides that it needs to get an oil change, it will take itself to the to the oil change shop, get its oil changed. And then, you know, anytime I needed to use that car, I would say I need to use it or any car and it would pull up. It would take me where I need to go. It would debit um, out of my account that ride fare and um, all the people that own that car or, you know, the public that owns that car. It would, the, the money taken out of my wallet would be distributed accordingly. And um, yeah, so that's kind of what this whole idea of a society based on these types of uh, smart contracts and with Byzantine fault tolerance to prevent any type of intrusion and, uh, and to be able to hack these types of, of uh, um, uh, this scenario um, is kind of what I think he might be talking about. I could be wrong, you know, but uh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, so let's see what a comment says. Uh, somebody, Robert, whoever Robert is, um, I wonder if Robert knew that he was going to be, um, you know, immortalized as a comment on uh, some a famous blog. Um, so uh, I, he says, I take it lie in quotes in the context of these fault tolerant protocols revert refers to altering the message. Yeah, yeah. And the Nick said, uh, sometimes the message can be altered, e.g. by summary and not considered by the rules, a quote unquote lie. Direct unaltered messaging can accomplished can be accomplished by cryptography, especially by hash functions. Um, plus, if origins need to be authenticated, i.e. Dig digital signatures, lie in the context of the property title registry consists in violating the title transfer rules or corrupting the database, e.g. by pruning part of the tree um, of transferred and subdivided property titles. All right, so cool. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, he's formulating Byzantine fault tolerance as a way to secure all these IoT and um, fourth industrial revolution um, type of uh, economy and solutions and everything being driven, society and, and property and law and government and everything being driven by smart contracts. And uh, since he is the inventor of smart contracts, you know, like... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so his, he says, my focus has been on, let's see where this goes, where this link goes. He, he links smart contract and smart property, the words. And so let's see where Nick Sabo links. Um, ah, he links, oh, maybe somebody came and created a link with it. Yeah, so they link smart contract. So let's just read the definition of smart contract. I have a little bit of time. A uh, smart contract is a computer program or a transaction protocol that is intended to automatically execute, control, or document legally relevant events and actions according to the terms of a contract or an agreement. 
Um, the objectives of smart contracts are the reduction of need and trusted meet intermediaries, arbitrations and enforcement costs, fraud losses, as well as redu reduction of malicious and accidental exceptions. Uh, vending machines are mentioned as the oldest piece of technology equivalent to a smart contract implementation. Yes, and I've read this. Uh, uh, a 2014's white paper about the cryptocurrency Ethereum describes the Bitcoin protocol as a weak version of the smart contract uh, as defined by computer scientist, lawyer, and cryptographer Nick Sabo. Since Ethereum, various uh, cryptocurrencies supporting scripting languages uh, will allow for more advanced smart contracts between untrusted parties. Smart contracts should be distinguished from smart legal contracts. The latter refers to a, a traditional natural language legally binding agreement, which has certain terms expressed and implemented in machine readable code. And I think that whole vending machine analogy, I think that's in God protocol. Uh, let me go down here to the God protocols by Nick Sabo written in 1999. Um, and uh, let's just see real quickly if I can just scan through and see that vending machine. See, here's trusted third party inputs, outputs, secrets, outputs, and he's describing this is 1997 that he's you know, trying to figure out, you know, the whole Calvin and Hobbes right there. Uh, it's a very 90s thing to put. Um, so let's see here. Um, let me just look vending machine, which I, I don't know how to search on this page. If I was using a word doc, I could search for the word vending machine. Um, but I think this is, oh, oh, oh. this is really short. Actually, this is not the long one that I read that uses that. Um, Maybe I'll read this on another day, um, the God Protocols, and we'll talk about it in detail. Um, I thought I read this one, but maybe I didn't. All right. Anyway, so that being said, I will call it a show. Um, I read Nick Sabo's article, um, an unenumerated and unending variety of topics is the name of his blog. And this uh, uh, particular blog post was called Liar Resistant Government. And it just talks about Byzantine fault tolerance and Byzantine general problem and stuff like that. And... Uh, and then how you know smart contracts and you know bit cold for him you know um, was based on the idea of smart contracts um, keeping tabs on and preventing this type of uh, you know liars and uh, collusion collu colluders and stuff like that and uh, it gives solutions to it through Byzantine fault tolerance. So anyway, a little history lesson there for you this morning. You know, Saturday morning, kind of just kicking it. You know, um, all right, kicking it tonight. I will be interviewing um, a guy, uh, Francois Andre Limited, is the name of his Twitter handle. And let's see if I can find it here real quick. Um, and he um, is uh, he, he's made his own shoes. Yeah, Francois Andre Limited Company. And uh, here's his shoes right here. Check these out. These are, and he's from Dallas, it looks like. And it's just three hours north of me. And uh, see here. And there's some high tops and low tops, but they're cryptocurrency themed shoes. And that to me is amazing. It's really entrepreneurial and stuff like that. I love that type of stuff, you know. So, you know, he, he's, you know, gone out of his way to, and not only just like, you know, for Bitcoin or Ethereum or something that you normally think he like picks a Raven coin here, you know, like of all the coins. And, uh, like he does some Doge shoes too. So Doge, I can understand cause that's a little more in the pop culture, but Raven coin shoes. If you see somebody with a Raven coin shoes, you're just like, wow, man, they, 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 they're in it. Uh, so anyway, all right. Um, yeah, I will talk to you guys tonight and, um, yeah. If you tune in, I'll be tuning in. I'll be going live streaming on float.app. All right. I'll talk to you later.